My baby dolls, we are back again. Another episode of Genesis is coming up for you. As always, I am your host, Ian Kahanowitz, and we have a great recurring guest uh, coming back to the show with Jimmy Leak. And Jimmy, you know, Jimmy's interesting because he, he takes a time period, uh, which is usually World War I, and uh, a lot of his books, a lot of, uh, especially baseball, he got three books on baseball, including one that we did earlier in the year uh, from the uh, Dugouts to the Trenches, which I advise everybody to buy because a lot of people don't know much about this kind of history. Um, it's, you know, it's 100 years already. Uh, back in 20, back in 1917, the United States entered the war, and of course the 1918 World Series was, um, you know, played in September. They shortened the season, and you know we're going to get into we're going to get into a lot of these players today from uh, Jimmy's book, The Ball Players and the Great War, which was published a few years ago in 2013. Those who served, where did they serve? Where did this nationalism come in? We're going to we're going to be doing um, a whole historical perspective of baseball and World War One. But before we even get to the book. Before we get to Jimmy, again, you are listening to the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network with the Zigzag Man, Ralph Tycho. We got great shows on for you this season. We got Goldenbach's University with the renowned author Peter Goldenbach. We got AP Press, Hal Bach on vintage sports. We got Giants baseball, Oakland A's baseball with Charlie O's niece, Nancy Finley. We got Chicago White Sox Cubs ball with a uh, renowned sports uh, lawyer, and uh, he has his own radio show in Chicago, Eldon Ham. We got Bill Cachetis in Philadelphia with Philadelphia Baseball, Past, Present, Future. We got Mark Littell and Mark Weiss and Mark and Mark in the midday. And, of course, you got me, which you are listening to, which is Genesis, the new age in sports and entertainment. And... Just to let you folks know, this is going to be published a little later, but the Los Angeles Dodgers, congratulations to them. They made the World Series last night, first time in 29 years. Now, if my New York Yankees make it, it'll be the first time the Dodgers and the Yankees will be playing since 1981. And, of course, I was 11 years old when they played, and I remember being so disappointed uh, in seeing the, the Yankees were up 2 nothing, and then they lost four straight to the Dodgers. Uh, but, you know, hey, 36 years later, I'm watching the Yankees coming back from a 2-0 deficit from Cleveland to win the American League Division Series uh, against the best team in the American League. Same thing's happening uh, with Houston. They were down 2 nothing, and, and don't forget, folks, they only lost the game 2-1 in the both two, and now the offense is produced. But the big story is the Yankee pitches are shutting down. Uh, the Houston Astros, which who, who owned the number one offense uh, in the American League with the Yankees coming in at two. And this team is surprising me. Even if they don't make it to the World Series, what a run. I still believe Houston could come back. Berlanda goes on the mound tonight. Uh, Saravino for the Yankees. Stay tuned. Baseball is so good this year. It's so good because I'm a Yankee fan. But if you're a Chicago Cubs fan, my condolences, they made the championship three times. They won a World Series, but, uh, you know, the Dodgers looked uh, amazing up until September, until they lost 22 out of 26 games. Uh, but now they look like they're rolling again, and, uh, you know, they have a great chance to win the World Series. They'll probably be favored. But um, that's another story for another time. We're going to turn the clock back now till around 1917, 1918. And we're going to talk about ball players in the Great War. Now, about ball players in the Great War, this book was written about those who served during World War One. And the good thing about this book is it gives um, selected newspaper articles, clippings of those who served in the Army, Navy, Marines, the Air Force, the kind of battles they were in, and what was their importance, not only in baseball, but their heroism on the battlefields, and there's a lot to talk about. And Jimmy, well, Jimmy Leak, you know, he's a contributor to Sabre Baseball uh, Biography uh, Project and is the creative director of Tail Light Communications, and he lives in uh, West Virginia. And don't forget, he just wrote that fantastic book from from the dugouts to the trenches. And, again, we're talking World War One. And if you want to know about this period, he's the man to tell you. Welcome to the show, Jimmy. 
Thanks very much. I'm glad to be back. I'm glad to have you back. This is a great book, another one. So even before I'm touching on World War I, even before I'm going to go into the baseball players, a hundred years before, from 1917, you go back to the 1815, you had this rise in nationalism after the War of 1812. And something similar is happening a hundred years later uh, with this whole euphoria about going overseas, over there by George M. Cohan. Where is this nationalism coming from? Boy, that's, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think the American population really didn't have a clear idea of, of what uh, the Great War was all about. Um, you know, it was, it was, the idea was still exciting to them, and <laughs> that excitement doesn't last very long once you're actually in the conflict. And you know, Jimmy, let me just say this for a second. I don't, I know that things were published after the fact, but let me just say something here. The Battle of the Somme, I mean, that's world renowned. Even, it was reported all over the newspapers back then. The British lost 60,000 you know, folks, in one day, in, in, a, in a slaughter in the trenches in France. It's unbelievable that I think that propaganda played a huge part. You know, the sinking of the Lusitania two years earlier. I think that the Zimmerman notice when uh, Germany tried to persuade Mexico uh, to go into war and to disrupt the Americans' attention span to Europe – uh, the U-boats, um, you know, sinking uh, American vessels, and, and the British propaganda was probably the most, um, the best of them all, because they, they painted, if you look at the, the cartoons of, from the period, from all the newspapers, you're looking at the Germans like they're big apes in, that, in the, uh, their uniforms with the, you know, the arrows on their helmets. And they're dragging women away and raping them, and they're this barbaric. They're the Huns, just like uh, Churchill. How, how much influence was that on the American nationalism? Well, I, th I think it did have some influence. The, as you say, the British propaganda was very good and, and very effective. And there was a lot of uh, American anger over you know, unrestricted uh, submarine warfare, that type of thing. And the Zimmerman telegram pretty much clinched it when uh, Germany was essentially offering uh, Mexico their lost territories if they would uh, come into the war. So uh, there, there were a lot of factors. I think, too, it sounds strange to say maybe, but I think there was sort of a, an innocence. Uh, involved as well. I mean, uh, the, the feeling was, okay, we're in it now. We're going to take care of this, and this thing's going to be over. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and you see some of that in in, in the uh, political and sports cartoons as well. Uncle Sam I mean, in a in, in a doughboy uniform, or Uncle Sam even in a baseball uniform on the sports page. You know, going over to take care of the of the hunt. Yeah, and and you know something. I always urge people to watch old films, but before the censors came in and before all this stuff, I always tell people to watch the movie All Quiet on the Western Front with Lou Ayers. That came out in 1930. It gives a great, great, great overview of what they were taught in schools, and it gives it from the perspective of the Germans. Uh, so it, it, it's heroic. It's the fatherland. You're doing a great service. And when these boys go out, and they're only boys, 18, 19, into the trenches, they're finding out something very different than all this hoopla uh, that's going on back home. They're finding it's a living hell. And um, I always urge people to do that. And, and, and part of this whole mystique about fighting and all this, you know, had a definite impact on America because now in 19, we have an all work of fight and no play. What the hell's going on with this? <laughs> well, you're talking about the worker fight order? Yeah. 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 That, that was very interesting. In the, in the summer of 1918, the government uh, said that uh, certain categories of American workers, American males, you either had to be in military uniform or you had to be in a job in an essential industry you know, in, in war work. And uh, there was a question for a while whether that pertained to baseball, and then the government finally decided, yes, it did pertain to baseball. And then the question was, uh, 
well, when does it pertain? When when does the order take effect? And then they finally decided that, and which meant the season would end a month early. And then the question was, well, can we play the World Series? And if so, can you exempt the just the players and the in the two teams involved? And they finally uh, agreed to that. And then once the the early World Series was over, uh, most of the ball players were either headed into the Army or Navy or into uh, shipyards or steel mills or onto their farms, that type of thing. And, and you know what You know what astounds me? Wilson, President Wilson ran on a campaign in 1916. He kept us out of war. And, and consequently, you know, 20-some-odd years later, Roosevelt did. But Roosevelt took a whole nother year <laughs> to get into the war. We're talking about Wilson wins the election in November of 1916, and by April, and again, I don't think he was sworn in again as president until March. I think in those days it was March he got sworn in. Next month he declares war. And you're going from a neutral mentality in 1916, and in 1917, 1918, everybody, everybody is gung-ho that a lot of these people expected the baseball players to volunteer because of their nationals. They're playing the America's game. Why didn't that happen? Uh, well, <laughs> there, were, there were a lot of uh, factors. Uh, for one, you know, I, I, I think it's just unrealistic. I mean, you, you can't hold up ball players or any athlete to, to that type of standard, really. Uh, saying, okay, your ball players, your role models, you should go first. Well, that doesn't really stand up to reality. Uh, the ball players, they, they may have families, they may have other commitments. Um, there, they, and there were some ball players, uh, Hank Gowdy among them, uh, who signed up right away. Uh, most of them uh, preferred to wait for their draft notice to uh, show up, which was uh, perfectly legal and acceptable and is what the majority of uh, young American males did, uh, but it, that, it didn't play well in some uh, uh, parts of the American sporting press. And, you know, when we begin our inquiry with Hank Gowdy, because he was the first uh, to go there. Now, let's talk a little bit about what Hank did during baseball, because he was part of that Miracle Braves of 1914. And what did he think about trading his uniform in for another sort of uniform on the battlefield? Well, Hank's a really interesting story. Um, uh, we're from the same hometown, Columbus, Ohio, uh, where I, I now live again. Um, as you say, he was a star for the Miracle Braves, and uh, when America entered the war, he had friends who were, uh, I don't recall whether they were active army or whether they were National Guard and then called up, but he had friends in uniform, and he talked to them about possibly enlisting, and even during spring training, he and Rabbit Moranville and Johnny Evers were all talking about enlisting, but it was uh, Hank Gowdy who did it uh, in, in the first couple of days of June. The, the Braves were in Cincinnati uh, for a series, and uh, there was a, a game rained out, and Hank hopped the train up to Columbus <laughs> and enlisted in the Ohio National Guard. Uh, which had just returned from uh, service on the Mexican border. And uh, but the, the, the guard wasn't ready to take him or, or other new recruits right away. So uh, Hank uh, rejoined his uh, his club and then uh, actually entered uh, into uh, active duty in uh, July. And you know something? He saw some of the worst fighting of the war. I mean, he, he saw, you know, yeah, he saw... Um, a lot of uh, duty overseas. Uh, he was part of the Ohio Regiment that ended up in the 42nd Division, the Rainbow Division, which had uh, elements from, I think it was 26 states in the District of Columbia. And they went over early. They went over very early. So by the end of 1917, after the uh, the World Series, um, Hank Gowdy and the b division were overseas, and they were in a quiet sector for a while as they you know, uh, learned their their business of war, uh, but in 1918 uh, they were in very heavy combat for for a long time. And before I move on to Eddie Grant, um, I just want to say, Gowdy 
<laughs> this is great because you gotta love it. He came home, you know, he played, he continued further his uh, play, but he also served in World War II as a captain, and he is believed to be the only big leaguer to both serve in both wars, and he survived World War II, and he died in 1966 at the age of 76. An amazing story, is, is uh, Hank Gowdy, you know? Yeah, he he was an amazing story. Uh, in World War One, he was a color sergeant. In World War Two, uh, as you say, he got himself back into the army as a, as a captain, and eventually was promoted to major. Uh, he didn't see combat this time. Uh, he was uh, well. I guess he must have been in his fifties by then. Uh, Fifty-three. He was yeah. a, he, he was, a, he was a, an athletic officer uh, down at uh, Fort Benning, Georgia which, interestingly enough, the, the ball field down there was named for him in the 1920s. So he was <laughs> he was uh, working with soldiers on the same ball field uh, that bore his name. Now Eddie Grant, what's his story? He became a captain, right? He became a captain, Eddie, Eddie Grant. Eddie Grant uh, was a captain, yeah. Eddie Grant was, uh, he played for several teams. Uh, at the end, he, he played for the John McGraw's Giants. Uh he was an interesting character. He he was called Harvard Eddie because, in fact, he was a graduate of, of Harvard uh, University. And um, uh, the the story is that uh, under a, a pop fly, he would say, "I have it," rather than "I got it," just because he couldn't <laughs> bear to be so ungrammatical. Right. Uh, you see pictures of Eddie Grant from his playing days, and he always looks sort of uh, glum and, and un, unhappy. He had lost his uh, young bride to uh, uh, from disease uh, before the war, and uh, when the war started, he and his former Giants teammate uh, uh, Harry McCormick, Moose McCormick, both ended up in officers' training uh, camp at uh, Plattsburgh in upstate New York, and they they both uh, got commissions. Uh, Eddie Grant was a captain and. Uh, Moose McCormick was a lieutenant, and, and they went to separate divisions. And uh, Eddie ended up uh, in, in the Argonne. He was, his unit was trying to find and relieve the famous Lost Battalion, and uh, they were working their way towards that unit. Uh, they were under very heavy shelling, and Eddie Grant was just exhausted. He was so exhausted that... By one account, he could barely lift a, a, a cup up to his uh, lips to get a drink. And uh, his men had tried to get him to, to go back to an aid station or, or just get out of the line for an hour or two, and he refused. And his uh, battalion you know, commander was, was wounded, and, and, and he took over the battalion. And when the showing started, he told everybody to flop, but he didn't get down himself, and at least not fast enough, and he was he was killed by a... Killed outright by a shell fragment. Wasn't he buried by the Germans of all people? Uh, no, he was he was buried near where he fell by the Americans, but I, I think it was in a in a German cemetery. Uh, uh, but he was, he was his body was later uh, reinterred in, in an American cemetery. He he still lies in in France. Uh, then the, the another part of that story is. Um, his old teammate, uh, Moose McCormick, um, he came back early with, with shell shock and uh, served out the, the rest of the war in a sort of quiet billet in, in, in the United States. Um, and after uh, Eddie was killed, uh, uh, Moose was one of the people who contributed money to the building the, the monument to him in the center field at the, at the Polo Grounds. And uh, he he went on. <coughs> excuse me. Uh, Moose McCormick went on to become the baseball coach at uh, West Point. And during World War II, like Hank Gowdy, uh, Moose McCormick wasn't on active duty, but he was a civilian athletic trainer for the Army Air Forces in, in uh, I think Long Island. So he came back from the war badly affected, but uh, rebuilt his life and and went on, and, and and I find his story very compelling as well. Yeah, McCormick was a big part of it. Now, this is even more in, more interesting than us, because you got Grover Cleveland Alexander here. He didn't even want to go to the war. He said he had to take care of his elderly mother and his, and his uh, 
and his brother, and people are like frowning upon him. Saying, what the hell's wrong with you? What's going on with him? Yeah, uh, 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 truthfully, he was a reluctant soldier, and he applied for an exemption and, and didn't get it. And uh, at one point, he talked about uh, joining the Navy rather than going into the Army. In fact, he even had an offer uh, to play on one of the Navy teams on the West Coast, but he, he waited too long. And uh, he was ordered into the Army, and he went. And by uh, all accounts, uh, he was a good soldier. Uh, I've been looking into that a little bit more recently. And, uh, uh, yeah, everyone had good things to say about him, and he ended up in a field artillery uh, unit. And um, they went to France, and they too saw very heavy uh, fighting in, in the last big push, the, the 47 days that uh, ultimately ended the war. But he, he was, <coughs> excuse me, he was... Um, uh, Lightly wounded. Uh, he, he wasn't ever in the hospital or that type of thing. But uh, he had shoulder problems from, uh, reportedly from pulling the, the lanyard to, to fire the the, gun, the big guns. And um, he had hearing problems. And uh, he probably had uh, uh, PTSD, what today we call PTSD as well. And... Uh, it's not in this current book, but uh, I've seen an account since where he said he never really drank heavily until the war. He he, had, he was a beer drinker before the war, and he learned uh, how to drink uh, hard liquor in, in the Army, and that, that affected him as well. So Grover Cleveland Alexander did his duty, did it well, and came back uh, badly affected, as, as many soldiers were. And you know that was the next question I was going to ask, but you but you um, you answered it. You know he was exposed to mustard gas um, when a shell exploded near him, and it triggered the onset of, of epilepsy. And like you said, you know he suffered from shell shock and was just plagued by the whole thing. People don't realize something: how loud the battlefield is when you're in a trench. And you read the accounts saying, well, you know, this big shell, you could hear it whizzing by. But when that thing explodes, your eardrums are pretty much bleeding. I mean, these are the grave conditions that you're uh, being in. You're in a trench. You've got rats running around. You're sleeping in mud. You're eating in mud. You're, you're taking a bath in mud. You're drinking mud. And, and, and now you, all you're doing is it's, it's, a, it's a fight between two different trenches because you're at a stalemate. And then one day, you know, your, your sergeant, your captain's like, okay, over the top. And then you go into what's called no man's land. And then that's where most of the, um, you know, uh, it's going to do you in because the other side's shooting in defense. And you're in the middle rushing almost like you see uh, 150 years earlier in the American Revolution, like they're marching right into the line of fire. Uh, and, and so people like Alexander became worse off, and people didn't understand that. Why is he drinking? You know, history always says, well, Grover Cleveland and Alexander, two things come to mind. Best picture the National League ever had, and two, he was a terrible drunkard. But why was he a terrible drunkard? You just gave the answer, uh, which is very important, that the war affected him terribly. Clarence Mitchell, what's up with him? Uh, Clarence Mitchell, he was he was with uh, Grover Cleveland and Alexander in, in the same uh unit, the 342nd Field Artillery, uh, there were five major leaguers and one future major leaguer in, oh, in, that, uh, in that unit. It, it's very interesting. Uh, of course, they had one of the, the finest baseball teams uh, around, uh, and, and a lot of those players played for their divisional team as well. Uh, and, and, they, and they did play a fair amount of baseball in the United States, and they played uh, a few games in, in – um, in France, but uh, once that last big push started, uh, those crucial 47 days, nobody had any time for baseball, and uh, all those major leaguers in that unit, uh, by all accounts, per performed very well. It's an amazing story to me that there were so many uh, ball players on one team. It's not that wasn't unusual in World War One. There were a number of very good, very good Army and Navy clubs that had. A, a number of, of major leaguers on them, but most of those teams, uh, you know, weren't in the sort of combat that the 342nd was. So uh, I, I find that re a really compelling story. 
Now, let me ask you this question. When you were putting together this book, this is basically a collection of stories and accounts from newspapers, from letters. You know, how much did you actually encounter where you had to say, well, this was important, this was important, that's important, you know? Um, that's, that's the thing. Well, this, this was something of an odd uh, project for me. You know, most of the books, I'm the author. Uh, this book, I was the editor, uh, and I, I had a lot of material. I had hundreds and hundreds of stories, and I, I still continue to, to collect them. Um, so you have to look at it with a, an editor's eye. You know, well, what's the compelling incident, or what's the through story that, that continues on that connects with with others? Uh, so I arranged them in the in the chapters that seemed to me uh, most logical. I imagine an, a different editor, a, another historian, would look at the same uh, hundreds of uh, articles and, uh, and arrange them in a different way and possibly find different meaning. That's that's the thing about these subjects. They're so huge, they're so vast that they're open to so many interpretations. And this, this one just happens to be mine. Now let me ask you, you got a chapter called Fast Nines. What are Jackies, what are all these uh, baseball uh, groups doing around the United States here? Fort Devens, I see, uh, the Great Lakes, you got stuff out in, uh, in San Francisco. What's going on here? Well, uh, you know, baseball was the national pastime. I mean, it really was the national pastime in 1917 and 1918. So when uh, American males went to war, baseball went with them, and it went everywhere. Uh, it, it's it's really interesting to see uh, every every installation of any size had uh, at least one ball team, and probably had more. Uh, you know, many, maybe even most uh, army companies had you know a company ball club. There was baseball everywhere, and um, for the most part, uh, the military used that uh, to, to show these uh, ball players and their organizations to to the public. Uh, you know, the, the Army Navy ball games were very often open to uh, civilian uh, spectators. Uh, very often, they were used to raise money for war charities. As you see, there were a number of really excellent uh, clubs that the American public saw. Uh, Jack Berry, the player manager for the Red Sox in 1917, had uh, a great ball club at the uh, Boston Navy Yard. By one account, they were they called themselves the Wild Waves. Uh, and that club, Berry had at one point he had 13 major leaguers, <laughs> and and that club could have beaten the, the uh, major league clubs at, at that point. And in fact, it was so good that the uh, <laughs> The admiral commanding the naval district up there, uh, I think, got somewhat embarrassed and broke that club up uh, to the benefit of other other uh, um, commands. Um, but there were a number of good Army and Navy ball teams uh, around New York City, and they often played games in the big league parks. Uh, there were uh, good clubs out in Ch near Chicago, Great Lakes, uh, Camp Grant. Uh, they had great clubs. Uh, there was a league out in the in the Bay Area. Uh, th there was just baseball everywhere that there were American troops or sailors. And you know something? Uh, well, you know something? You break these chapters down: soldiers, sailors, Marines, aviators, uh, gas, uh, and flame. Let me ask you this question: When a baseball player uh, knew that he was being drafted, say like uh, Alexander, you know they. They they asked the league, can we finish up what we're doing, and then we'll go overseas. How are these guys, how do they know the drafting board, where to put these guys? Why wouldn't they just put all these guys, like, in the safest uh, arm and division of the uh, military, rather than just say, you're in the Army, you're in the Marines, you're in the Navy, and you're going to be a fly boy? Uh, well, when you were drafted, uh, you went with the other men from your town or your county. Uh, Grover Cleveland Alexander went with uh, a dozen other uh, men from his, uh, his little hometown or his county in, in Nebraska. Uh, you know, he wasn't singled out. Uh, so they all went to uh, Camp Funston uh, in, in Kansas. Uh, 
but th- but that said, once he got there, I mean everybody knew he was coming, so they they nabbed him for the the ball club. They nabbed all the major leaguers for for the baseball team, but they still went into regular units. So uh, th- to some extent, it was the luck of the draw. I'm sure to some extent, in some commands, it was the and the commanders intervening say, okay, I, you know, I know this ball player is coming. I, I want him uh, to, to come work uh, for for this office or this company or whatever and, and play on, on the team. And I mentioned Jack Barry's club up in, up in Boston. Uh, when they broke that club up, uh, two of the, the players, uh, Herb Pennock and, and uh, Mike McNally, uh, were sent to Europe. And, and McNally uh, expected to serve on a command ship and in Ireland, and Pennock expected to go to a destroyer in the Mediterranean. But when they got to Ireland, um, uh, Admiral Sims, the commander of the naval forces in Europe, uh, nabbed both of them. There were there were officers on the dock waiting for that ship to dock, and, and say, "Okay, now report to." Uh, uh, Navy headquarters in London because you're working there and you're playing on our ball club. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, you know, and, and you know, some it's it, it's funny because um, the propaganda continues because I'm sure there were those who gripe, then but then there is those that like you know uh, Leon Leon Kadori and um, you know Benny Kaus they're writing back hey this is great you know. Benny Kels was like, I love being a ball player, but every man who's not a slacker, they should be in the Army with me. <laughs> well, you, you really got all sides uh, of, of opinion. Um, uh, some players, uh, frankly, did like being in the service, and, and some players didn't, but, you know, performed their, their, their duty anyway. And, and uh, probably... Uh, the sports writers and sports editors had their opinions as well, so they, you know, they would they would play up what they thought or the players that they liked, and and and, and ball players in uniform always made good copy anyway. So uh, if, if you came across or somebody shared a letter from a ball player to a friend, uh, that would likely end up in, in on the sports page as well. So you, you heard a lot, of, an awful lot from the ball players who weren't on the field anymore, but were in military service. Now. The sailors, you would think that going into the Navy um, would be a safer bet, but it wasn't due to the fact, again, you have the U-boats, and then again, uh, you got the German battleships going on. But most of the guys who enlisted and, and who went into the, and were drafted, went into the Navy, they started as a yeoman. man. Let's describe what a yeoman man is. And then, you know, they shifted these titles into new billets, replacing... Uh, them with enlisted women, popularly known as ye old women. Well, what's going on here? Well, uh, yeah, a, a yeoman was uh, was and is essentially a clerical position. Uh, a, an earlier version was called a, a ship's writer, um, and there was a, there was a lot of criticism of uh, ball player yeoman, uh, especially up in Boston. Uh, most of those. Uh, Red Sox and Braves players who were with uh, uh, Jack Barry were, were yeoman, and they were in, you know, essentially office billets, and there was a lot of criticism of that. And when uh, the Navy started uh, taking uh, women for the first time, uniformed women, uh, uh, officially the, they were yeoman as well, but the newspapers called them yo-women. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> the... Uh, they began to, to place, replace the uh, uh, the Navy ball player yeoman in in the shore billets, and uh, they went to sea or overseas. And uh, but the idea of uh, ball players as, as yeoman didn't go over well in some quarters, especially uh, the sporting news. The sporting news was fairly brutal and, and uh, snide remarks and. Uh, <laughs> And the reporting, um, but but it was you know, interesting. No, I mean it is. I mean this whole thing is uh, fascinating. The Marines are the hardest division, and I love the fact in your book 
The German troops in France call the Marines the two Phil Hunden, which means devil dogs, uh, a name that the Marines embrace. Now, the Marines are the first ones in. They have the toughest training at uh, you know Paris Island. They're the ones who are the best trained out of all four divisions um, of the armed services. You got Eddie Collins coming in here. You got Chief Bender coming in here. Uh, what was the appeal of the Marines if you know that you're going to be the first one on the uh, battlefield? Well, I think that was the appeal. <laughs> <laughs> Who the hell wants to be the first one on the battlefield? I gotta keep my, I gotta keep my arms so I can pitch. I you gotta keep my arms so I can catch. What the heck's going on with that? Well, the, the Marines have always had the, the reputation as, as the, the toughest and, and the first, and, and that appeals to uh, uh, some people. And uh, ball players are very aggressive uh, men themselves, and, and to some of them, that's that's just where they wanted to be. I mean, Eddie Collins, uh, as you said, uh, enlisted in 1918, but uh, he didn't make it overseas. Um, uh, the the, uh, the Marine who was uh, the, the Marine ball player who was uh, most famous during the war was a guy named uh, Hugh Miller, who, who frankly wasn't much of a of a ball player. He played one game in Philadelphia in, in the majors, and he played for the St. Louis Terriers in, in the Federal League, um, a, a very sort of mediocre career. But uh, if he wasn't much of a ball player, he was a very fine Marine and was highly decorated and wounded twice. And, in fact, he was in the hospital when, when the war ended. And uh, his playing days were over uh, anyway, so he didn't ever try to go back as a player. But he did try to go back onto the field as an umpire in his – his wounded leg just wouldn't allow him to do it. Uh, but the, all the attention he didn't get as a ball player, he did get as a Marine, and, and justly so. And, you know, Wally Pip and Tris Speaker, where the heck are they learning to fly airplanes? The plane is, what, only 14 years old at that time? And, and America, the United States, didn't even have... Uh, an air force, pretty much. They used they used to, I think, uh, drive the sop with camels, or they were uh, partitioned with the French. Where are these guys going into aviation and flying? I, I, do they even know how to fly a plane? No, they they, they didn't know how to fly one yet. But the, the, Wally Pep and Tris Speaker both uh, were uh, both naval naval aviation cadets. Uh, they were learning to fly down in uh, Pensacola, where they. Uh, naval aviators still train today, and but but they were in training when the, when the war ended, and they were very quickly back into uh, civilian life. Hey, it's it's unbelievable that you just take not only an ordinary Joe off the street, but probably the best center fielder that has ever played the game, and Tris Speaker, and you put him up in the air. What's even what's even more is eye popping is the gas and flame unit here because. We all know Christy, Math Christy Matheson died at a young age. Uh, what was he, 40 years old, I think? And then Ty Cobb, these guys were in the gas and flame unit. What's going on here? And, and let's talk a little bit how they both were exposed to this kind of stuff. Yeah, the, the gas and flame division, that was the popular name for it. I mean, it was, essentially it was the chemical warfare service. It was the, the people who threw the, uh, the smoke and the poison gas. Um, there were a number of... Uh, Ball players or, or executives who uh, ended up in that uh, <laughs> in that unit, and I, I think they sort of recruited each other. Um, there was uh, Matthewson, uh, Cobb, uh, Branch Rickey was a major. Uh, George Sisler uh, was a lieutenant, though he didn't make it overseas. Percy Houghton, uh, president of the Braves, he he was a, a major, and I think he, he uh, recruited some of the others. So uh, Ricky and uh, Matthewson and Cobb all got overseas very late in the war, uh, and uh, Matthewson and Cobb were there was a training exercise near the U.S. Army headquarters in, in France, and unbelievably they were using actual poison gas, <laughs> and the, the exercise was you know to put on your mask and walk through the the, the gas and leave the, the chamber, but through some incredible screw-up, nobody saw the signal 
put on the mask and the gas was released and all these soldiers were exposed and a number of them died. And Matthewson got a, a big dose. Uh, Cobb got a, a, a smaller dose and they stumbled outside. Uh, Cobb felt the effects for some weeks, but it never really uh, lingered. Uh, Matthewson, uh, it was worse. He, he, he got more of it into his lungs. Uh, it wasn't the direct cause of his death, from tuberculosis in 1925, but it was certainly a contributing factor, you know, the, the damage to his lungs. You know, people don't realize that if you were fortunate enough um, to survive a gas attack, because sometimes you couldn't even put on your mask, you're stumbling, you see the gas, you're literally seeing the gas coming across uh, the battlefield, and if and so, and your masks were sometimes not even on your face; they were hanging. Yeah, you know, they were a pain in the ass because you couldn't move around um, so much because they got in the way. And if you didn't get your mask on in time, uh, you could either be again mustard gas was pretty much the the, uh, the most potent of all that. You'll burn from the inside out, and or if you just got a slight whiff of the gas, you'll have an immense cough. And you'll have like burning indigestion every day every second of your life until you finally die. That's how potent this stuff was. I can't even begin the logic on how they didn't even try to protect these players, uh, not only the players, but those in the units more so uh, than they did and that they were exposed to this kind of stuff. Yeah, it was, it was really a, a, a terrible weapon, and um, it had been in use for quite a while by the time the American troops got into action. And... Uh, you know, the gas masks were pretty uh, rudimentary equipment, but it's, it's all they had. And uh, if you were exposed to it, it depended on uh, how long and how much the exposure was to what effects you might have. You know, another one, uh, Gabby Street, the uh, – <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> excuse me. Gabby Street, who had been Walter Johnson's uh, catcher in Washington and was later the uh, – the Cardinals manager, he was on a gas unit, and he was in combat. And uh, when he came back in 1919, the sports writers noticed uh, some scars on on his chin from, from gas exposure. He, he had been wounded in, in, in that last big push. So he was another one in the... In the gas and flame, though he was actually on the field, he wasn't he wasn't a trainer like the officers. He was he was a sergeant, and he was in, in combat. You know, one of my favorite players from this era was Johnny Evers, and I had a show on him a few weeks ago. Um, a fascinating, a fascinating character. Uh, he didn't even like uh, his his, uh, his, fo- his fellow shortstop over there, uh, Tinker, because they fought for years. But let me ask you this: the influence of baseball came with the Americans, like we discussed. How did the French take this? How did they pick up the game of baseball? Well, it's very interesting you bring up uh, Johnny Evers. Um, I, I mentioned him earlier. He, he and Hank Gowdy and, and uh, Rabbit Moranville had talked about enlisting. Gowdy and Moranville both did enlist. Moranville was in the, the Navy up, up there in, in Boston with the, uh, the Navy Yard Club. Um, Evers couldn't get in because of, of arm problems or nerve problems in, a, in his arm. He, he couldn't get into the Army. So he uh, joined uh, the Knights of Columbus, the Catholic Service Organization, the, the Knights in, in the YMCA and the uh, uh, Jewish War Board and, and a number of other organizations uh, sent people overseas uh, in uniform. Uh, they were all wearing officers' uniforms with their own organizations insignia, uh, so they didn't stand out on, on the battlefield. Um, they sent them over uh, as what they were they were called secretaries, and they ran uh, troop welfare and uh, athletic uh, uh, activities. So Johnny Evers went over to be an athletic director. He was based in, in Paris, but he no sooner got there than the, the French asked for his services. Uh, there was a French general who was married to an American woman who, who was familiar with baseball and was – Impressed with the, well, particularly with the grenade throwing skills of, <laughs> of of the American soldiers. You know, they uh, they threw baseballs and they threw grenades and they threw them really well. And and this general wanted uh, Johnny Evers to come and teach uh, 
uh, his troops to, to play baseball because he thought it would make them better soldiers. So Evers and, and uh, one of his companions went to a, a, a French uh, military school for a couple of weeks and, and taught people to play baseball, and, and most soldiers would teach other uh, soldiers to, how to play baseball. So there was there was uh, a fair amount of interest in at least uh, one part of the French Army in, in, in learning that sport because it seemed to make them uh, the, the players good soldiers. You know, I'm going to be talking right now. I want to segue this segment of the show into the next time that I have you on the show because next time I'm going to be talking about the king and baseball. Now, this is very odd to me. I'm just going to talk about two things here. Number one, what interested King George V in baseball? Well, what interested the king in baseball was the Americans. I mean, the, he he needed the American allies. And uh, he wasn't the most charismatic person himself, King George V, but he had a sort of genius for working with the Americans. Uh, he was interested in all things uh, related to the American Army and the, the American troops, um, and there were there were fifteen or twenty thousand Americans in England, I think. M- many of them with the air service learning to to fly or to uh, uh, maintain the machines, uh, and, and the, there were Navy sailors there as well. And there was a a baseball league, a military baseball league in London in 1918 that had four American teams and four Canadian teams. And, and I should say that the Canadians played baseball during World War One, long before the Americans arrived. The, the, the Canadians took the game with them as, you know, in 1914 and 1915. So there was this uh, American League in and around London. And uh, the Army, U.S. Army and Navy headquarters teams in, in London decided to have a Fourth of July game. And somebody had the bright idea, uh, why don't we invite the king to come and play? And I don't have this in writing anywhere, but my theory is that George V was awaiting for exactly this sort of invitation uh, because he accepted immediately and said, I will be at your ball game on the 4th of July at uh, Stamford Bridge. And um, when he did that, that little holiday game between two military teams, immediately became this big international event, uh, gained vast importance, uh, gained a, a lot of publicity, and all eyes were turned towards the Army-Navy uh, ball players uh, at Stamford Bridge, uh, where they still play uh, uh, what the British call football and we call soccer. That's still the home of the Chelsea Football Club. So the, there was this uh, holiday game that drew tens of thousands of, of Londoners and, and Allied troops yeah, with the, the king and the queen and other members of the royal family in the grandstand. Uh, and it was really quite an event. And and you know something? You lead me right into my second question, and then I'm going to end the <laughs> inquiry there. I'm going to end the inquiry here because we got to have a show on the king. I don't want to give away too much details. You mentioned holiday. Our holiday, it's July 4th. What the heck is the king thinking? It was the Declaration of Independence against his own country, Britain. That's right. That's right. Uh, and the 4th of July was essentially a holiday in London. Uh, I know that. After 142 years, the British were helping us celebrate our holiday of our independence from them. And uh, American flags flew beside British flags. Uh, atop the public buildings in London that day. And the Londoners just went out of their way to make the uh, Americans feel welcome and, and to help them celebrate. Uh, you know, we were in this uh, death struggle in this war against Germany, and the, the, the king was going to make sure that he, the royal family, and everybody else that he could influence were uh, going to uh, do everything they could to make the Americans feel welcome and wanted and needed as they were. And, you know, I'm going to end it like this. And the ironic thing about this whole thing was that King George V was a cousin of William Kaiser uh, Kaiser, uh, Kaiser Wilhelm. Uh, they, were, they, they almost looked alike, same beard, same height, 
that you, you couldn't even tell them apart, really. That's the weird thing about it. Right. And, and, and he, his other cousin was the, the Tsar of Russia, who they did look, look like. Uh, uh, the king and the Tsar could have passed for Nicholas. The twins almost. They, yeah, Nicholas, they, they look so much alike. Yeah, I mean, this is all fascinating stuff. You know, I, I hope you had a good time today because I had a great time. I love this stuff. You could tell that I just get so passionate about this stuff because you're mixing two of my favorite things, history and baseball, and um, I just had a fantastic time. I love when you're on the show, Jimmy. Well, great. Thanks. I, I like being here. You know, it was, it was really good. I'm going to send you an email. Um, we'll get you back on the show because uh, I got your book, The King, uh, the Game, the whole game that, that took place downstairs with my million other books. i got to go <laughs> archive it by uh, author's last name. But this is still selling. Where can we find Where can we find ballplayers in the Great War? Well, as, as far as I'm aware, it's uh, available on all of the, uh, the online uh, bookstores. And uh, if your local bookshop doesn't have it, I'm sure they can order it. It's from... Uh, McFarland and Company, and they do a lot of good uh, baseball books, and uh, I was happy to do this with them. Ah, oh, it's a fascinating topic. You know, I've I've learned so much from your two books alone, and uh, I still I'm halfway done with the the uh, the uh, book with the King, and we're going to get into all the details in a month or so. Uh, but I want you to hold the line because I'm going to end the show, and then I'll talk to you for about a minute afterwards, folks. I had a great time with Jimmy today. Stellar stuff. I mean, if you're into this kind of history like I am, and all, I know all of you do, uh, you love the history that I do. I mean, I've taken you back this week to the 1870s, and, and World War One baseball is just important. Uh, we are honored to have Jim on our show because he is the authoritarian here of the World War One era in baseball. Um, we'll get him back on the show. Uh, go out, get this book. The holidays are coming up. Uh, it's a great read for anyone who loves the sport and who loves this kind of genre in the uh, 19-teens. And, uh, you know, add it to your collection because it's definitely well worth it. Uh, as always, I'm Ian Kahanowitz. You have been listening to Genesis. And from the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network and for Jimmy Leak. And in the immortal words of Edward R. Murrow, good night, folks. Good luck. We'll see you tomorrow.